So much has happened in the last third of a century. We're still fighting against the most colossal blunder and hoax in medical history. I'm proud to be among you. I've been thinking back to the beginning of the epidemic. In the early 1980s came the first reports of allegedly rare diseases among gay men and intravenous drug users. It was scary and mysterious. The media did their best to terrify us. We were told to check ourselves for swollen lymph glands, marks on our skin, night sweats. We were told to avoid sex, wash our hands a lot, and be afraid. From the very beginning, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, ordained that a new infectious agent was responsible. They completely ignored drugs and anything pecu peculiar to the circumstances of the two main risk groups, gay men and intravenous drug users. I sensed that the CDC were on the wrong track, and I naively thought that I would be able to help them. After all, I was a survey research analyst, and as a gay activist, I knew the gay world. Boy, was I ever wrong. Behind the scenes, people were fabricating the AIDS narrative, and the last thing they needed was for me to butt in with reality. For a while, I couldn't decide whether the, the CDC were dishonest or incompetent, and finally decided both. <laughs> They were truly incompetent, ignorant of elementary statistics. At the same time, they lied. Government agencies, mainstream media, AIDS groups, big pharma, they all lie, all of the time. My first major AIDS article in 1985 showed that the CDC deliberately construed AIDS as an infectious disease rather than sicknesses caused by toxins. Looking back on the AIDS war, I'm overwhelmed by its enormity. I long since gave up trying to track the deaths of people with AIDS diagnoses. I stress diagnoses since there really is no such thing as AIDS, which has never been defined rationally. The CDC changed definitions many times, began conflating AIDS with HIV disease, and simply stopped reporting on AIDS deaths. What we do know is that well over half a million people with AIDS diagnoses have died in the United States alone. In addition, countless tens of thousands of people with HIV positive diagnoses have died without ever progressing to an AIDS diagnosis. To put these figures into perspective, in all of World War II, there were 407,316 military deaths. In World War I, there were 116,708 deaths. These casualties were recorded to single digits whereas a plus or minus figure for AIDS deaths would run to hundreds of thousands. No one knows. Almost all of these deaths with pe with, of people with AIDS or HIV diagnoses were caused by worthless and toxic drugs and the terror caused by AIDS propaganda and by the false information of the AIDS establishment. Heroin users were told to keep shooting up with heroin, but to do so with clean needles. Gay men were told that poppers or nitride inhalants were harmless. In this talk, I'm going to concentrate on two main points. Number one, our messages should be as simple as possible. Number two, we must survive. From the beginning, AIDS talk has been technical. The AIDS establishment bombarded us with propaganda 
about branches of the immune system, T cells, CD4 ratios, retroviruses, new and rare diseases, to the point of information overload. On our side, Peter Duisberg countered by talking about proviruses, biochemical activity, titers, latency period, mitosis, and so on. The birth group put forward technical arguments that the ELISA and Western blot tests are worthless. It is one thing to communicate with specialists, but it is also important for us to communicate with open-minded non-specialists. I'll give an example. In 1988, the New York native published an article of mine, The Epidemiology of Fear. The AIDS establishment, grossly misinterpreting some rather tentative research, was claiming that unless effective drugs were found, were developed, virtually everyone infected with HIV would die. Writing as a survey research, research analyst, I showed that, that these journalists were totally ignorant of basic statistics as well as common sense. I always sent copies of my articles to my parents who lived in a small town in the Midwest. My mother called saying she had some questions about that article. I assumed she had not understood some of the statistical concepts, so I started to explain them. She said, oh, that's obvious. Then she said, she'd written down a list of things she didn't understand. First of all, what is DNA synthesis? I was taken aback. Most of us have a general idea of what DNA synthesis is, but there's something else to describe it on the spur of the moment. And frankly, I can never remember more than one of the DNA building blocks, thymine or thymidine. We can make a simple case against the orthodox AIDS model. At one point in the 1991 Medetel documentary, The AIDS Catch, narrator Michael Bernie Elliott says, quote, AIDS was not behaving like an infectious disease. That's it. Truly infectious diseases do not remain compartmentalized tightly confined year after year to a few so-called risk groups. Sooner or later, a truly infectious disease will spread into the general population. This is something an ordinary person can understand. AIDS is not a coherent disease entity, but a construct whose definition has changed repeatedly. Basically, an AIDS diagnosis requires two things, HIV plus one or more of the so-called AIDS indicator diseases, which are well over two dozen. But the AIDS indicator diseases have nothing in common. Some are caused by bacteria, some by mycobacteria, some by viruses, some by toxins, some by funguses. Some have no known etiology. Some, like dementia or wasting, can have many different causes. On the list of AIDS indicator diseases is Kaposi's sarcoma, which was once the hallmark disease of AIDS. The most dramatic moment in Larry Kramer's play, The Normal Heart, is where Kramer's lover sees a purple spot on the sole of his foot. The audience is shocked. They know that he is doomed. At first, Kaposi sarcoma was considered to be a rare form of cancer. Patients were given cancer chemotherapy, which quickly killed them. Everything changed in 1994, when top AIDS experts, including Robert Gallo, spoke at a meeting in Washington caused by, called by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. At this meeting, these government experts admitted that Kaposi sarcoma was not a cancer after all, but an, an affliction of the blood vessels. Kaposi sarcoma is not caused by HIV. It is not associated 
with any kind of immune deficiency, but rather with an overactive <coughs> immune system. The only tenable hypothesis for the occurrence of Kaposi sarcoma among gay men is their use of poppers or nitride inhalants, whose biochemical properties make them ideal candidates for causing Kaposi sarcoma. So then, if Kaposi sarcoma is not caused by HIV or immune deficiency, is it still an AIDS disease? Yes, it is, and no, it isn't. The AIDS establishment can't decide. Being committed to an infectious disease model, they have proposed still another virus, HHV8, but this is an absurdity from an epidemiological standpoint. The other half of an AIDS diagnosis is HIV infection, which can be inferred through various tests, all worthless or simply presumed. Yes, presumed. If a gay man or, or intravenous drug user presents with an AIDS indicator disease, a doctor is permitted to make an AIDS diagnosis by simply presuming that HIV is the cause. It is all crazy, but a vast AIDS industry running into tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars a year is based on this craziness. I think that ordinary people, if intelligent and open-minded, can understand the craziness of the prevailing AIDS definition. Another issue that can be understood by non-specialists is ACT, which was once the premier AIDS drug. As I found from documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, ACT was approved for marketing by the Food and Drug Administration on the basis of fraudulent research. Blatant cheating took place, especially in Boston. The FDA itself uncovered this cheating, but nevertheless deliberately used data which they knew were false. ACT is the most toxic drug ever approved for long-term use. ACT has no benefits of any kind demonstrated by good, honest research. As a random terminator of DNA synthesis, ACT is necessarily incompatible with life. ACT is directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. Let us not forget ACT, although the AIDS establishment would like to forget it. However, having said all of that, it's no longer so simple as just debunking the AIDS paradigm. The AIDS industry, or racket, or swamp, or mob, keeps moving the goalposts and making new paradigms without abandoning the old ones or ever admitting they were wrong. It's like Hercules battling the Hydra monster. As soon as he chops off one head, two more heads emerge. The AIDS experts now talk about HIV disease and HIV infections rather than about AIDS. Here we need to confront the bogus tests that are used to diagnose HIV infection. This necessarily gets technical. We need to debunk the ELISA and Western blot tests and the quantitative misuse of the polymerase chain reaction tests. We need to argue that true HIV infection, or viremia, has never been demonstrated, even in a single case. We AIDS critics don't need to agree with each other on everything, but we need to explain what we mean by a virus, and in plain language. Speaking as a layman, neither a doctor nor a, nor a virologist, I sense that Peter Duisberg and the Perth Group have different definitions of what a virus is. For the Perth Group, a, a virus is a cell-free particle. For Duisberg and other molecular biologists, a virus might be genetic sequences in DNA. 
Perhaps I'm wrong about this, and in the discussion period, someone can, can clear this up. And the AIDS, or rather HIV establishment, has changed the game plan still again. Now it is about, quote, pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. People allegedly at high risk are expected to, quote, take HIV medicine daily to lower their chances of getting infected. The main drug is Truvada. Ads for Truvada in print and on their website blatantly target gay men. The sheer horror, healthy people are being brainwashed into taking a toxic drug to protect themselves against a virus which is either harmless or non-existent. Now I want to talk about survival. We must be strong because psychological warfare is being waged against us. The two, the two key chapters in my 1993 book, The AIDS War, are The Risk AIDS Hypothesis and Recovery from AIDS. In the first, I focused on the early, the early AIDS cases who were very sick. I argued that under the AIDS umbrella, different risk groups and different individuals were getting sick in different ways and for different reasons. And then I went into detail to describe what those health, what those health risks might be. In the other key chapter, Recovery from AIDS, I said that someone with an AIDS diagnosis should examine his life, detoxify his body and mind, adopt a healthful way of living, and expect health. This is still true, but now we are dealing with people given uh, HIV infection diagnoses. These people may be completely healthy before getting their diagnosis. After that, it's downhill. The psychological consequences of the diagnosis are deadly. Even deadlier are the drugs. In counseling people diagnosed with HIV infection, we need to convince them that all of the HIV tests are worthless and that true HIV infection has never been demonstrated. We need to argue against the protease inhibitors and other drugs in the so-called cocktails. Contrary to Big Pharma's propaganda, these are not miracle drugs which have enabled terminally sick patients to arise like Lazarus from their sick beds and begin to play tennis or climb mountains. On the contrary, these drugs are causing healthy people to get sick. They're causing hideous physical deformities and death. In Massachusetts, where I live, the leading cause of death among the HIV positive is death from liver failure caused by the drugs. Since they have not developed an AIDS indicator disease, these are called, quote, deaths before diagnosis. Now, more than ever, we need to deal with the psychological factors affecting those with AIDS or HIV positive diagnoses. In 1997, Ian Young and I edited a book, The AIDS Cult, Essays on the Gay Health Crisis. Our contributors discussed the ways that AIDS propaganda was making people sick. Fear was making people sick. HIV positives were programmed to become sick and ultimately to die. It is not easy when we try to persuade an HIV positive that HIV is either harmless or non-existent and that the drugs are unnecessary and harmful, we are, we are up against the AIDS establishment and the mainstream media. I myself have failed more than once. One young man listened to me up to a point. He still believed in the virus but intended to fight it without taking drugs. He was then in robustly good health. 
Unfortunately, he continued to see a doctor. One day he told me that he was going on the drugs after all. Almost hysterically, he said, I don't have any T cells. I tried to explain that he looked perfectly healthy and the T cell tests were worthless, but he wouldn't listen. Within a few months, he had begun, he had begun to lose muscle tone and his aura had become fey. F-E-Y, fey. Um, it's a Scottish word meaning under a spell of doom. Um, well, I haven't seen him for eight years now. I have no idea what happened to him. <clears throat> our greatest enemy is fear, which wrecks our health and causes us to make bad decisions. I experienced paralyzing fear early in the epidemic. I knew that my health and indeed my life were in danger. Fortunately, I was in between jobs and had money in the bank, and there were cheap flights to London. Packing only a carry-on bag with good walking shoes and a book on country walks in England and Scotland, I escaped what Michael Elder called the AIDS zone. They were wonderful walks. One in Scotland was almost 30 miles long. For over a month, I walked and walked and walked. On the first or second walk, my fear went away. I felt at peace with the world and was happy to be alive. Walking is a cure for many things, including, as I found out, high blood pressure. But we all have to discover our own ways of dealing with fear. For me, one way is music. Right now, I'm going back to the Bach two-part inventions, practicing each one slowly until I finally feel I can do justice to it. In conclusion, we must be resourceful. We must survive. We must be strong. We are David against Goliath. In the short run, Goliath usually wins. In the long run, we will prevail because we have one thing that Goliath, the AIDS establishment, does not have the truth.